From the Bent Pixel Studios in Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Phone Booth Fighting. With me, Richard Hunter. And myself, Frank Meir. We do this uh, for you absolutely free and twice weekly via iTunes, via Stitcher Radio, SoundCloud, Google Play, or wherever podcasts are made available. You can just go to phoneboothfighting.com if you can't remember any of that and play it right there off the front page. Frank, we have a lot to get to. On this episode, we have some mixed martial arts to talk because we have a big uh, UFC heavyweight fight coming up this weekend. We're going to talk about that. Uh, the darkest of all segments on a monthly basis here on Phone Booth Fighting is when we check in with Bisbee, Arizona for a celebrity death pool update. If you're playing in uh, one of our leagues, then you'll be particularly interested in that. Uh, we'll be talking to Joby and Chad Shank down there at the Doug Stanhope compound momentarily, or uh, here in a little bit, uh, rather, maybe maybe a little longer than momentarily. Um, also, an interview I did uh, earlier today, it's a little quick interview, but uh, a conversation I had with actor Paul Walter Hauser. Now, if you don't know the name, you probably know the movie that he is currently starring in, I, Tanya, the Tanya Harding uh, story is out now. Allison Janney just won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. Fantastic movie. Seen it. It's a uh, dark comedy. I mean, you, it's it's weird to think something like that is funny, but it is. Uh, well, it was, we got such bumbling and just it was. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. It was almost like a story. In fact, had that not really happened, and you just made a movie that was completely fictional, people would say, "Ah, bullshit, man. Come right. on, people aren't that dumb." Right, but. They are. Yes. And uh, Paul Walter Hauser played the role of Sean Eckhart, the obese, yeah. quote-unquote, bodyguard of Tanya Harding that was the mastermind yeah. behind the attack. So I had a had a fun visit with him. We'll be uh, playing that a little bit later as well. But before we – there's Paul. Pull him up on the uh, screen there. Before we get to all that and before we uh, get into this weekend's UFC London card, Frank, we have to get into some Low T Nation. Yes. LowTNation.com is the way website that is changing so many of our listeners lives uh on a weekly basis we're talking about our male listeners our guys that are you know maybe you're uh getting into your your late 30s now into your 40s maybe even we've heard some from some guys that are in their early to mid 50s and you just don't have the the get up and go you used to the energy levels aren't what they used to be uh they're checking in with lowtnation.com they're doing the free telephone consultation with uh, our uh, our guys, Dr. Weeks and uh, Brandon over there. And uh, in short order, they're feeling the difference. They're feeling the effects. Frank, give everybody an idea of what's involved. Well, you know, hey, uh, health is the, the greatest asset you have. And, you know, as we get older and through injuries and through, you know, father, you know time, uh, you know, your hormone levels can get out of whack. And so by having this uh, free phone call, you can talk to, uh, you know, uh, people over there at the uh, Low T Nation. And they'll do a preliminary uh, consultation and find out if you're even, you know, if you're somebody who's a candidate for this type of treatment, if it could improve your life. If that's the case and you pass that first step, then they're going to send you out to go do blood work. Uh, at a lab core, they have one in every state here in the U.S., almost damn near every major city. Uh, once you go down there, that's the most effort on your part you're really going to have to do as far as time. Uh, once you get that done, they get your results within a day or two. They can look at it. The physicians sit there and they can prescribe you what you need. And on top of that, which I really think is a great thing, that you have your general practitioner that you go to, and you want him on board. You don't want different doctors not knowing what's going on. You want everybody in the same loop. So that's another thing that Brandon and them over there specialize in, is making sure your doctor understands exactly what's going on and what they're going to do for you and how that can help you out. Uh, once everybody's on board and you start the treatment, they ship it directly to your door. It'll show up, and that way you're consistent all the time, and it's extremely convenient. A lot of other places provide this service, but you have to either, A, make a weekly visit to the doctor, which, I mean, come on. That's crazy, you know, to think that you're going to do that. And it's very important that once you start this treatment that you have to be consistent with it. Otherwise, you're throwing your hormones all over the place, and you're no better off. Uh, we want to hear your success story. So after you uh, go to lowtnation.com, 
call the uh, toll-free number, get the free telephone consultation. Uh, you get on board with Low T Nation. Let us hear from you. Uh, tweet us your progress. Post your pictures. We've seen some great ones. Yeah, we are, and uh, we uh, want to see more of them. So, uh, who's our one listener that went from the? Uh, he looked like the pool boy. Now his wife calls him. Yeah, yeah, that guy was in his 60s. Oh, man, I mean, it's the point where I'm looking at him going, I got to tighten up my diet some more. You yeah. Know I mean? Like, this guy's in his 60s. You see, there's no excuse now. And that's the thing. There are a lot of excuses for physical fitness and training and eating right. But people, you know, like anybody else, you go out there, and especially in January, we all made these New Year resolutions to lose weight and do better. And you're turning your wheels in the mud. If you don't have the right platform, you can try as hard as you want, and you're just not going to be able to have the success for the amount of effort you're putting in. Talk to the brand and them over at uh, Low T Nation, and that way, all your effort is actually rewarded because you're you're, you're firing off on all cylinders. Log on to the website to see what we're talking about. LowTNation.com. All right, Frank. UFC London is uh, the location for this weekend. Now, this is a UFC Fight Pass card, so it's uh, uh, going to be viewed exclusively on the UFC's digital platform. But it's got an important heavyweight contenders fight uh, as its main event. Fabricio Verdum, currently ranked number three among UFC heavyweights, has taken on Alexander Volkov, sitting in their number eight position. Verdum uh, coming off of November's win over uh, Marcin Tibera. That was uh, a decision victory. Uh, and Volkov last TKO'd Stefan Struve in September. Uh, Verdum with a uh, 23-7-1 MMA record, 11-4 in the UFC. Uh, in addition to being known as uh, a, a guy whose guard you do not want to find yourself in, uh, also boasts a Muay Thai striking style. Now that is uh, going to be matched up against Volkov's kickboxing uh, karate base style, and that in a nutshell, is our narrative here because uh, Volkov is a very tall, rangy heavyweight. He's six foot seven. He's going to have a three inch uh, height advantage and a reach advantage over Verdum. By the way, uh, uh, Jennifer always thinks it's funny when they talk about how a guy enjoys. A height advantage. Have you ever heard that? It's no. always the term they use. Yeah, they, actually, you're right. I, yeah. they, how they enjoy it. You're right. Yeah, yeah. That. They always I never she, thought about it. But yeah. Whenever they talk about it, it's funny. She's seen enough fights now. Whenever they say that somebody's got a, a reach advantage, she just looks at me and she goes, he'll enjoy that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's going to enjoy having that reach advantage. But uh, Volkov uh, will be the taller, longer uh, fighter. He is on a three-fight win streak. This is a guy who, uh, I don't know if it's, you know. In the UFC, five fights overall. I, yeah. I pulled it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, five fights overall, three fights in the UFC. And I don't know if it's, you know, the 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 Russian thing, the language barrier or whatever, but, you know, this is what I refer to as one of those quiet winning streaks that mm -hmm. this guy is on. Uh, he is uh, 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 the, the epitome of of a dark horse contender making his way up the ranks. That being said, though, this is going to be a real uh, talent test for him because this is his first challenge uh, against any uh, former champion within the UFC. So, on paper, uh, it would uh, stand to reason that Alexander Volkov would like to keep this fight standing. Fabricio Verdum might like to get it to the ground and get uh, the the longer, taller Volkov into his very active guard. What say you? Yeah, you know what? It's a fight that I'm going to go with. And very few times do I ever really bet against Verdum. And, and here's just another time where I'm not going to. He's somebody that, I mean, uh, Fabricio doesn't have great knockout power. He just genetically, you know, is not an explosive athlete. You see that with his takedowns. You see that, I mean, that's why somebody with his jiu-jitsu expertise, he's probably one of the greatest jiu-jitsu guys competing in the heavyweight division, but his submission game is not powerful. It's not devastating. I mean, he doesn't just rip limbs off. And, you know, he's very good at sweeping, being on top, using his jiu-jitsu to gain superior position on guys. Uh, his stand-up, same way. He, he's not a knockout artist, but he knows how to fight with that, um, I don't think the height that Volkan's going to have is going to throw him that much off because we've seen what he did against Travis Brown two times. Mm -hmm. He's able to strike well with those guys because he's very busy with his striking. A lot of other heavyweights that hit harder naturally tend to throw less punches because they're looking for that. They're comfortable with that one or two shots knowing that guys fall down. Well, I think Verdum is an extremely intelligent. I don't think I know. He's a very smart guy. He knows that he can't just land and throw one punch and it's going to do anything to you. 
So he's very much of a volume guy. He throws good combinations and actually technically is a very good stand-up guy. A lot of people don't give him, I think, the credit that he deserves because he doesn't have that scary knockout power. He doesn't feel like a threat, mm -hmm. but he overwhelms people for two reasons. One, I've already stated, because he doesn't sit down and, and, and really throw hard uh, because it's a waste of time for many ways. He doesn't generate any power. So he throws great combinations and he throws kicks because he's not worried about the other reason he's a good striker. He doesn't care if you take him down. Other guys, especially heavyweights, are like turtles. They typically can't fight off their back. So if one of them throws a head kick and slips and the other guy jumps on top of them, that could be a fight-ending mistake because most heavyweights can't get up off their back and that's all they try to do. When's the last time anybody besides Verdum or myself you see actually fight from the bottom mm -hmm. and, and be actually a dangerous threat from there? So because he has that, I think he's going to throw with unabandon. Some of his takedowns are pretty unorthodox. Uh, his drag sit-through sweep that he used, like on Brandon Vera, he used it on Brown, uh, is very good. He gets people down. Plus, he has no problem pulling half guard, knowing that he can sweep you, move you around. And, and Vulcan is only a purple belt in jiu-jitsu, and he has a couple submission finishes. I think two in all his fights, but he he. I feel like the people that beat Verdum are guys that can out wrestle him, keep him from being taken out, you know, uh, and hit him hard, like you know uh, we saw our current you know the current champion of UFC uh, uh, Stipe do. Yeah, if you. Don't threaten it, and, and, and Vulcan has knockouts on his record. You know, I think about 18 or 19 when I was looking at his thing, but uh, they're more TKOs. He, he overwhelms you, hits you from a distance, and just frustrates guys. I, I just don't see him being able to do that to Verdum. I think Fabricio is going to be a very uh, capable striker against him on his feet, and then eventually in the scrambles, it's going to go to the ground, and he's just going to out jujitsu him there and wear him out and uh, and really be able to just dance around him in that area. Do you think maybe uh, Verdum volume striking game doesn't get the credit because it's something that evolved in his career you know yeah. it's not always something well, that it's, we it's kind of like first impressions yeah pretty much whatever you start out at that's mm -hmm. what people you know just will know you for uh it takes a lot of uh, to curve people's minds go oh you actually are good at that now mm -hmm. pretty much it's like you know it's like first impression is what people hold uh, you know even now with my boxing being the level it is I, I, my hands are a huge threat I knock people out down in fights yeah. but when people first think of me they think, still think like oh submission guy ground guy right. like, well, yeah still and I worry but but my hands now are equally dangerous and, and Fabricio same way I think he suffers from the that his striking game evolved with his career yeah. we are Already seen him and seen him you know his first stint in the UFC he wasn't a good striker at all he was the kind yeah. of guy that pulled guard uh, uh, the fight with you know uh, was it was it Andre no no that was hit upon him what was uh, well, you know, he got let by the go by the UFC. Oh, Dos Santos. Yes, Dos Santos. Was, just, yeah, he got you know, cut after. Yeah, he yeah. burned him. You know, I think yeah. it was a 15-second knockout. Yeah. Uh, so people kind of saw him at first that, okay, this guy's a wizard on the ground, but on his feet he's not capable at all. Then Fabricio, he worked hard. You know, he trained with Babalu. You know, the guy, you know, went down there and, and shoot a box and really focused on his stand-up and kept his jiu-jitsu. He didn't have a style drift. And it's improved. Then he made a second stint in the UFC and, and went all the way to gain the, the heavyweight title of the world because of his stand-up. It really became, I mean, it's one of the things that if you're trained for Fabricio, you have to acknowledge that he has good stand-up. Does he have one-punch knockout power? No. Mm -hmm. But he can tag you up. He's very good with knees, throws head kicks. I mean, and again, going back to the fact that he has no fear of you taking him down. In fact, you, in his mind, you're doing him a favor. You know, he'll do jumping sidekicks. We've seen him jump up in the air and put himself at risk that other heavyweights would never do because in their mind, it goes, well, if I make a mistake, I'm giving up a free takedown in top position, and they don't have the skill that Fabricio does to may even begin to afford to make that uh, you know mistake. Co-main event on this uh, Saturday's UFC London card is going to be a contenders match in the light heavyweight division. The poster boy Jimmy Manoa, currently ranked number four by the UFC, takes on number 11 ranked uh, Jan uh, Blakovic. Now, this is a rematch of 2015, uh, and uh, 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 Blakovic uh, decisioned Jimmy Manoa, unanimous decision back in uh, 2015, 
Uh, close uh, fight I'm, I'm sorry. Let me let me actually right. let me uh, take that back. Uh, uh, Manawa yeah, they, uh, uh, got the victory. What I was going to say though is he's one of the only guys. I think he's only decision. Victory, it was. Right? It yeah. was. It was every every other fight uh, Manawa has had has ended in KO one way or another. Who, yeah, what, yeah. what I meant to say was yes, Manawa won the fight, but uh, 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 Blackovic actually outstruck Manawa by one punch. Uh, yeah. Forty-four to forty-three was the the punch count uh, during the fight. But th- there again. Maybe not a tremendously exciting uh, uh, fight, but an aberration for Manawa because, as I said, every, every other one of his fights has been KO. So, so in a situation like that, Frank, do you think sometimes a style matchup can just for whatever reason, when you you put certain guys together, they're just going to fight a certain style against each other, or do you think something like that tends to be an aberration? And if I can give you a guy like Jimmy Manoa, who win or lose is either going to sleep or putting somebody to sleep in every one of his fights, that it stands to reason he's going to be able to do the same thing here. I don't know. I've seen it both ways. I've seen it where guys have switched things up and able to make adjustments, and it wasn't necessarily that guy. And then I've seen fights like uh, uh, Bader and Phil Davis that basically yeah. look exactly the same. It's like, well, these two guys, when they get into the cage together – this is what they bring, and this is what their strengths are going to constantly balance out to what kind of performance we see. And and fighting is very much about a dance partner. You know, who's the other guy across you? Styles make for different type of engagements, and some styles are more entertaining than others. And uh, you know, I think Menowa typically has an extremely entertaining style, but in this fight, you know, I still think that it's going to actually change a little bit. Um, in this situation, I'm kind of leaning towards that Menowa will be able to make the adjustments and, and and go for the knockout, which I think typically he does because I think he realizes that he's a high-octane athlete. The guy is extremely powerful, whether he uses that power or not. And that's something a lot of guys have to kind of acknowledge if they're, you're that kind of athlete. Uh, like it's kind of like basically the polar opposite of a DS brother where you know Nate and Nick realize, okay, we're not power athletes, but we can overwhelm you because we have phenomenal cardio. Yeah. They can fight for days, so they just throw and overwhelm you with shots. Uh, if they were to hold back and try to go for knockouts, it would actually hurt their style. I think Minowa is very intelligently chosen to go, look, if I hold back and don't throw – with the intensity and power and, and the takedowns that I go for, I wouldn't have the knockouts over, you know, St. Pierre, you know, or St. Peru that he has. Uh, so that's why he kind of has that style of live by the sword, die by the sword. I'm either going to take your head off or I'm going to, you know, you're going to take my head off or I'm going to gas out in the attempt to because in 15 minutes, whether he throws a punch or not, he gets fatigued because he has so much. I mean, the guy is a very powerful. I mean, I put him in the top five of power punchers in the UFC. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> But and he utilizes it correctly. He fights the right way. You know, I know I've heard other people talk. Well, if you know, if he held back a little bit, did this. I'm all, no. Then he's just going to not use his weapon and be yeah. tired anyways. You think back to last summer when uh, Manoa was knocked out by Volkan Olstemir. I mean, he was right on the cusp of yeah, a lightweight well, title Volkan shot. Volkan got the yeah, title. Yeah, I mean, he there. basically took his title t- took his title shot away from him because uh, coming into that fight, Manoa had knocked out uh, Corey Anderson and and, and OSP. Uh, that yep. you mentioned. Not only uh, does he have a lot of knockouts, but they come very quickly. 11 first round finishes in uh, his career of his uh, 15 yep. knockout wins, Jimmy Manoa. Well, and I, and I like that he fights that way. And another example of not doing that is if, if he were have had won that fight, because he got caught with a vicious uppercut against a cage, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, and he would have got the fight against DC. You know, Anthony Johnson, who I think's pound for pound the hardest hitter that ever was in the UFC. Yeah. But in the, his last outing with uh, 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 DC, he held back. In fact, started wrestling with DC and tried to like get top position. And he really nullified what he's so good at and was tired anyways. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden, you see him get taken down in the second round and gas, where it's like, wow, now you gassed anyways. 
because you know you, you know it's like some guys are sprinters, some guys are middle distance guys, some guys are long distance runners. There's different genetic backgrounds you have with tendon insertion, muscle fiber type, your nervous system, lung capacity for your VO2, your natural hemocrit level, your red blood cells. I mean, there's so many things you can go across the board and go, well, this is what kind of style of fighting you could be good at. And Minowa, again, is a explosive athlete. If, he, if you don't fight according to those strengths, you're not going to be very good because now you're going to be a mediocre middle distance runner. You know, it'd be like if I took, you know, a... Uh, uh, Usain Bolt, right? The greatest sprinter, I think, of all time now, right? I mean, hard to argue against it. What do you have, like 9, 10, 11 gold medals? You know, I know he got mm -hmm. one taken away, but, you know, three Olympics in a row, he's the gold medalist for the 100 and 200. But if I tried to make him into an 800 meter runner or a 1600 meter runner, I'm not saying he wouldn't still be good, but he's not going to be what he was, you know? Mm -hmm. And if he trained for that and then tried to go do a 100 meter sprint, he, he wouldn't have the same uh, intensity. So as a fighter, as a mixed martial artist, you know, you have to fight to your strengths and try to hide your weaknesses, make them difficult, you know, uh, to get a hold of. And, you know, and too many guys, and I've done this mistake, we try to build up our weaknesses and make them our strengths. And guess what? They're never going to happen. Your weaknesses will never be your strengths what you can improve upon them, but you want to make sure your strengths are still your strengths, and that's where you're going to put you know, the lion's share of your, your effort towards. Turning our attention to your current MMA home, Frank, uh, Bellator MMA, and your division, your heavyweight yep. division, uh, a couple of former opponents of yours are uh, upset yeah. with each other. Uh, Roy Big Country Nelson and... Mirko Krokop. I heard they're fighting, yeah. Yeah, now, now they are going to fight, and a war of words has already broken out. Now, you could kind of see that possibly coming from— last, I didn't know about this guy. I know yeah. that I, I heard about the matchup last week because— yep. uh, 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 Man, I get hit in the head too much. Yeah. Someone told you about it? Yeah, in the Was gym. Was another former Who, opponent? Who's his, who's, his, who's his coach that— Trains here in Vegas, K1 kickboxer, Dewey Cooper. Shit, sorry, Dewey. Yeah. I've trained with him and known him for years. Yeah. I've known Dewey since I was 19. That's sad, my yeah. brain. Anyways, uh, Dewey is Southpaw, and I made a joke when I heard about him fighting. I'm like, yeah. uh-oh, buddy. You know, as Dewey's gotten a little heavier as he's not been an active fighter. He's retired. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I guess when you got that, you knew. Because Dewey's a – he's won the K1 here in uh, the U.S. down in Vegas, so he's won the North American K1. He's a very good kickboxer, and he's left-handed. Yeah. So, so as I knew the match, I'm like, oh, you're going to have to go from pad holding to jumping in there and being a sparring partner. And then I mentioned to him, like, hey, whatever the timing is, it's right. If you need me to go in there, you know, you know, now that Roy's not in the tournament, we're yeah. not going to see each other anytime soon. I'll help out. I can simulate, you know, miracle. Oh, okay. So you might be involved in. Uh, yeah, the, I was totally helping okay. him out. Yeah, you just put out the invitation. Yeah, All I right. can dance around and, and throw one kick around yeah. and run from you. Very nice of you. Okay. <laughs> just got to get on the bicycle and move a lot. Yeah. Move backwards, move backwards, move well, backwards, move backwards. I'll be interested to get your uh, take on this feud here then because, you know, it's probably not a surprise that. Uh, uh, Roy Nelson is is outspoken, but Mirko Krokop, not really known for uh, the trash talk. In fact, a man well, who was— Well, he's actually said things before. I just don't think people give it attention. I remember that? Mirko talked trash about me, Alistair Overeem, and Fabricio Verdum. Oh. Because it was a fight card that he was on in, in, called Legends. Yeah. Uh, he fought the—who's uh, the guy who choked out Travis Brown recently? He's like 42— Oh, oh, the guy that did with the uh, uh, the Russian yeah. guy, right? He was fighting him, and it was uh, was it were we in Italy or Russia? Um, we were somewhere overseas. Yeah. I think it was in Moscow. Yeah, and so uh, Ruslan, the owner of the yeah. Legends, invited. The, the look up that guy's name, by the way, Mike. He just it's looked like up Alexei Travis Olenek. Or something. Yes, Alexei yes. Olenek. There yes. we go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm pretty sure if we look, yeah. uh, Alexei fought uh, Mirko. And he, okay. And he, let's see. Yeah. On the fly. Oh, Mirko Crow Cop, you too. So anyways, so as I'm looking this yeah. up, um, I'll find out if... Uh, anyways, so we were there as guests. And, you know, come watch the fights. Hey, the guy bought me a plane ticket. I got to bring the wife. It was a trip. It was yeah. nice. We got to hang out. Yeah. Then he set up a couple seminars for Alistair, myself, and for Doom so we could make some money. Yeah. Um, good experience, right? When but was this? This was like, well, I, when I pull up the actual fight. I mean, a few years ago? Yeah, it was or? about three or four okay. years ago. Got it, okay. Uh, mixed martial arts record. 
Yeah, it was, uh, well, he fought Olenek November 8, 2013. Okay. Legends, yep. Okay. And it was in Moscow. And so we were there as guests. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember, and it kind of was funny because I saw Mirko, and even though we fought each other, there's no bad blood, you know what I mean? Like, no, I mean, this is a man who once afforded you the opportunity to put one of your testicles back inside yes. your cup. That was very gentlemanly of him. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's worse things you could have done <laughs> with my testicle. <laughs> but anyways, uh, uh, so one of the people interviewed, like, hey, how do you think that people at the time, all of us were under UFC contracts? Yeah. You know, uh, uh, what do you think about, you know, do you feel like it's great that the show brings stars here like this? And and he was like, if I was Dana White, I'd fire them all. Like he said that. Mm -hmm. We might even be able to find, if you can find the article. And I was like kind of shocked. Like I'm sitting there and I'm looking over at Alistair, like, you know, like why as they're translating what he's yeah. saying, I'm like, you, you think he should fire us? Because hold on, man, we're all supporting MMA. The fact that we're here might bring more attention to your performance tonight. Like, like, wait a minute. Like, why are you talking? Yeah. And so it actually surprised me that Mirko talked trash about us by saying that, you know, that we're being disrespectful to our company that, you know, because mm -hmm. we're contracted by the UFC that we shouldn't be at other fights. I'm all, fighters show up at other people's fights all the time. Right. I mean, John Jones them. is just Bellator. Yeah, we yeah, corner you'll, people. You'll, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, it's like, just because you fight for one promotion doesn't mean that you, yeah. you oh, I can't be seen in another promotion. I'm if, all, you, if you're Conor McGregor, you jump in the cage yeah, of the other promotion fucking, to... Yeah, to chastise a referee. Yeah, smack him around if he's not. Um, yeah, uh, so so uh, to your point, sometimes okay. Mirko, I mean, can be. Yeah. But, but you know, I think because of Lang, I don't, I don't know. Like he doesn't get the rap for being obviously a, a, a Chael Sonnen type, right, you know. But right. but uh, he can be a little harsh with the words. So what did exactly? Yeah. So happen here's now? what happened. So so uh, Roy Nelson fired the first shot. He he told uh, our friends over at MMA Junkie last week that he believed uh, Crow Cop was, quote, back on the special supplements. If you remember, Crow Cop tested positive for HGH right after uh, either tested positive or he just came out and admitted he'd used it, one of the two. But he did admit it, and it was right after uh, the USADA era began. And that was when Crow Cop retired. If you remember, he was just like, Well, okay. up to that point, Crow Cop was on TRT. So he yeah. was doing that legally and through the proper channels, and just it became banned with – with uh, USADA coming on board. You know, that's when, you know, Dana and them just didn't yeah, want to. Yeah, right. But but he he uh, admitted it and then and then retired and, of course, has since unretired. But Nelson fired that uh, shot at him. And then uh, Crow Cop responded thusly on his Facebook page. Um, you can, you can uh, yeah. kind of. Dear Roy Nelson, yeah, you don't ahead, have to go. worry about. Yeah. That I'm using any special supplements, as you claim. The only special supplements I'm using is two hard and bloody trainings per day, five days a week. And I'll be tested, like all others, during preparation for the fight and before and after the fight. So you can be calm and start thinking of some good excuse after I beat your fat, disrespectful ass. And you have enough time to say May 25th and do me a favor, please, and shave that disgusting beard. Look like a professional fighter and show respect to your opponent. Good luck. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I I don't know. You know, as far as uh, he's upset about, you know, uh, where Roy's going with this. Uh, but, I mean, as far as, I mean, my personal experience with Mirko, when I fought him, he was very respectful in the fight. You know, I mean, yeah. he made that statement. That's why I think it shocked me and Alistair because, you know, we've competed against him when he when he, he made that comment about us getting fired. You know, but yeah. if he was Dana White, I don't know where in translation or where in understanding of cultures that was lost. But even when I fought Mirko and, and won by knockout, he came inside my locker room afterwards. was like, oh, man, I didn't even see what you caught me with. And we were talking like – two buddies that were sitting there going, hey, man, great fight, this and that. I was like, yeah, man, that, that you only landed like two leg kicks in the fight. And uh, I was already swelling up. You know, I was like, yeah, dude, wow, that is a heavy leg kick you have. And I was impressed with your strength. And it was like a compliment back and forth. It goes, oh, you know, your stand-up really threw me off. I didn't expect you to be that good at it. You know, your improvements are all. I mean, it was a very, you know, you know, hey, yeah. I mean, I mean, and most guys, when they get knocked out, don't want to talk to the guy. He's a consummate professional. And, you know, came in and, and we discussed things. I mean, leading up to the fight. I mean, well, well, he fought Pat Barry. The guy had dinner with him before they fought. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that, you yeah. know. And, and uh, you know, in fact, actually, Mirko, because he's fought so much, uh, doesn't take it personal. I remember when we were fighting each other and I had shoved him against the cage. 
he goes, uh, you know, go ahead, let, let's just fight out in the open. I'm like, and then my reply to him was like, all right, cool, but then we get to fight on the ground for a little bit. You know what I mean, like, <laughs> I'll fight you without shoving you against the cage, which I have been fighting you out there in the open quite a bit because Mirko's not the easiest guy to take down. In fact, that's one thing I was telling Dewey, like, you know, I know Roy's already fought him, but Mirko's static strength is actually very impressive. I remember he sunk dug, double underhooks on me. And so my thought, you know, 255, 260-pound guy was like, okay, that's cool. And you can do that right now. But if I drop my weight yeah. and make you carry me, you're going to basically hold 250 pounds in your arms. How long can you do that for? Yeah. Mirko did it for 15 minutes with no problem. Like, I mean, it wasn't even uh, like I can feel you starting to break. You know, like if I grab someone, I'm like, all right, you're yeah. trying hard, but I can feel the quivering in your muscular system. You're only going to be able to do this for so long. He had like that handshake that like, you're never going to loosen up, are you? Nope. So his static strength, his ability to hold a position, very impressive. One of the better of anybody I've ever fought. Oh, interesting. Well, it's uh, it's a one-off deal for Mirko. I think he's just got the one deal with Bellator, and then he, he claims to be on a retirement tour. So mm. he's uh, just going to take a few more fights, and there's this one in Bellator, and then he probably goes back to Ryzen or something like that. But I'll tell you what, he actually didn't get the worst of uh, Roy Nelson's ire this week because he may have accused uh, uh, Mirko of being on the special supplements. But, you know um, – we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Matt Mitrione was upset because he right, felt like Roy Nelson cage, had yeah. the toe in the cage. And even though Mitrione won the fight, he felt like that prevented him from uh, sweeping him out of the crucifix in that third round. And, of course, we debated that on that uh, episode. But uh, Roy Nelson was asked about that this week, and he said uh, – he said, I don't know. I think uh, Mitrione's just uh, uh, upset because everybody was talking about him cheating on his wife all week. Whoa. Ah. Why, why would Roy do Roy, come on, man. You, you got the quote right there? This uh, is uh, certain lines we don't cross, and I don't agree with crossing that line. Wait, wait, wait right there, oh. right there. Wait, stop, stop, stop. Uh, uh, yeah, here you go. Matt's a guy, here's Roy's quote, Matt's a guy that's always the pot calling the kettle black. Uh, again, he, he said this to MMA Junkie. I think it was in the same interview. I think he's still upset because he's cheating on his wife and stuff. That's all I heard that whole week was him cheating on his wife. So I think he has a lot of guilt, and he's going to take his rage out somewhere, but there's no cheating on my end. I think he's just upset because in his heart, he didn't really feel like he won. He wasn't the best fighter that night. Well, I, I agree with the how he ended that conversation. I think that you know that it was definitely a draw, and they should have had a fourth round. Mm -hmm. I think that you know Mitrion won the first rounds, uh, ten nine, ten nine. I think that he lost that third round, a ten eight round. And I yeah. think a lot of people agree with me. You know, what I mean, yeah. th that should have been a. We well, talked about it. Could have been a draw. Could've yeah, that should have been a draw, draw and they should have yeah. went to a fourth round. And seeing how fatigued Mitrion was, if there was a fourth round right now that night, and you said, "Okay, quick, where's your money?" I'm going with Roy. Mm -hmm. You know, all right, mm -hmm. well, you know, Roy figured out to take him down, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and Mitrione's not able to stop his takedown and can't do anything once he hits the ground. And, and, and that's just, I mean, we all know that. Mitrione says, and I don't want to give away too much because he might try to improve upon it, and I hope he doesn't. <laughs> I hope he continues to hate grappling. Yeah. Because he takes that effort into his training, and it's very evident when he fights that he likes stand up, and his stand up looked really beautiful the first round and, and half of the second round. He's good on his feet, man. The guy is an NFL caliber athlete that has learned stand up, and because he enjoys it, that is one of the most important uh, um, attributes to have towards success. Is do you like what you're doing? If you like it, you're going to be good at it because mm -hmm. you're going to train at it. You're going to think about it. You let it consume you. It's no longer work because you like it. Mm -hmm. uh, if something you just hate it and it's like fucking pulling teeth, you're not going to spend extra time. You're not going to be focused. In fact, at that moment where someone's showing you something, you're like, fuck. Instead of going, yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that guy's dangerous. And so the fact that Mitrione can't seem to fall in love with ground and doesn't like the aspect that, you know, you're an MMA fighter, you're not a professional kickboxer, uh, hurts him. And, um, you know, and so I, I agree with what, but, but as far as like, I, I don't know, I've always kind of had this unspoken. <laughs> rule when it comes to I know talking like, shit about uh, fights like hey look we got to sell fights but yeah. like you never say something about someone's wife and you never say something about their children yeah I just think that that should be sacred if we can now make a rule right now 
we don't talk about each other's wives and we don't talk about each other's children. Like that just kind of goes out of the realm of like, this is a professional fight. If you certain shit talk, it might get you that we're not going to actually make it to the cage because now I have to fuck you up in a street fight. Like I'm going to, you know what I mean? Like we're not going to get to the professional fight now. Now I'm going to put a knife in your fucking leg. You know what I mean? Like you talk about my children or my wife. That'd make the promoter sad. Yeah. It's like, we might not make it there. I'm going to cut you, bro. You know what I mean? Like you're talking in ways that now are no longer, this is not a sporting event anymore. Now it's, you know, you're making this personal, you know? See, that's why I would, I would be the worst trash talker because I would just be like, uh, my opponent uses a lot of double negatives. Uh, I've noticed, uh, he seems to have a, remedial understanding of democratic socialism. He uses the word gots. Who yeah. uses the word gots? <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. All right. Well, anyway. Yeah, I don't know, Roy. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, that's between them, but uh, I, I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, I defended Roy as far as in that fight when Mitrione said that he cheated and hold his toe. We looked at the video. You can yeah. go back to our podcast. We discussed it in full. No, I don't think that attributed to Mitrione being able to get out. But now the discussion of this talking about i mean saying that you heard that a man was cheating on his wife and now you throw it out there and now mitrion's wife it's like hold on man that guy's a father you know he has yeah. kids like uh you know what i mean like yeah i i, I don't know man I, I i don't think that's very cool it is it's also weird to, i mean the the ambiguity of it too yeah. like you said is well because of, it's one of those yeah. things that you're making a statement yeah. that it's like well i heard, I heard right. you're pulling a fucking trump move now yeah. it's like well people you know are saying, people told me it's everyone's like, saying uh, yeah no it's like true. i mean now you yeah. put it out there it's like you know come on man you know like i, I don't know yeah. uh, i do know that's fucked up you don't say yeah. it's shit like that you don't talk about like you leave people's wives and children out of the debate you know in yeah. fact even if my opponent ever in the future fires off about my wife or my children i'm not going to fire off about your wife or children either just because you're going to be dishonorable doesn't mean i have to be dishonorable but uh uh fair warning i will get even in a way that isn't going to be inside the uh cage all right wow okay that's that, that, that was a lot to digest right there mikey that's uh I Some think, of uh, that pets should be on that list too. Pets, good one. Yeah, pets. Yeah, I guess if you teach me about my dog, my little Tuli, I'd be a little upset too. Yeah, my baby. Yeah. yeah, who could tease someone about a defenseless animal? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. that's shocking, man. I'm really surprised because I mean, Roy has a, you know his wife Jesse, and they have a child together, and you yeah. know, and his wife is very much part of his career, and I mean probably more visual than most other wives as far as you know she manages him, and she's uh, you know. Probably more on the if you are going to be a scumbag and talk shit about people's wives, you know, he himself is going to put himself in a situation where now she's more accessible. I don't know what Matt's wife even looks like. You know what I mean? Like she's, you know, she's, you know, know, they don't have that kind of relationship where she's, you know, managing him and in in the spotlight. Whereas Jesse has even managed other fighters. I remember when I first met Dan Hardy, he was being managed by, you know, by, by uh, Roy's wife. So, I mean, uh, she's, you know, in the MMA world, you know, so because she's more in that world, I guess if you were going to go ahead and cross those boundaries, she's even more vulnerable to it. You know, people are going to have more interactions and stories and some kind of thing. And, you know, uh, I don't know. It look back to UFC for a second. It looks like uh, UFC uh, two. Uh, what's the Chicago card coming up uh, in uh, June? Uh, in, uh, UFC um, uh, in in uh, Chicago, uh, UFC two twenty five. That's what it is. June we'll 9th. be yeah. June ninth. We'll be going to Chicago. It looks like Frank. We may have our main event for that card if Yoel Romero is to be believed uh, on his recent appearance on Joe Rogan's podcast. He says that uh, he will be fighting Robert Whitaker for uh, the middleweight title. If you remember that whole hodgepodge, we had Romero versus Rockholt because Romero versus Whitaker got tabled because Whitaker fell ill. And so now uh, uh, Whitaker is expected to be back, and uh, he will take on the uh, now interim middleweight champion, Yoel Romero. No, no. Yoel's not the interim, right? Well, Yoel beat uh, Luke Rockhold. But he didn't make weight. Was oh, that's right. I forgot yeah. about that. Totally yeah, forgot you, about that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a lot more the to whole story. debate was, right. should he get the title shot, even though he beat Rockhold? Because he, yeah, I'm sorry. You're yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, I right. mean, it's the only time Yule's ever missed weight in his whole career. Yeah. You know, as a, an Olympic international level wrestler, you know, he's made weight 
every time. He's never missed on that level before yeah. or any competitive level that we've ever heard of. So, I mean, it was a mistake that happened, you know, and, and so it cost him the opportunity to actually be the interim champ, which first it was – Whitaker was the interim champ because you have, you know, Bisping lost the championship to, to the unranked – uh, one-off fight of GSP, and mm-hmm. then GSP says now he can't defend it, and basically won and done us. And now, then they upgraded Whitaker's title now from the interim to the actual. Then, because of his injury, created the interim title that Whitaker, or excuse mm-hmm. me, Yoel and uh, uh, Luke Rockholt, Rockholt were yeah. supposed to be fighting mm-hmm. for, but then Yoel doesn't make weight, mm-hmm. missed it by a pound, mm-hmm. and. Uh, now it knocks him out. What was it, second or third round? Smashed him with a yeah. left hand and completely put him to sleep against the cage. Uh, and so now, I mean, I think though, I mean, missing it by the one pound, it wasn't a gross seven or eight yeah. pound miss. Uh, he he's he doesn't have a body that shows you that he's. It wasn't because of not hard work. Uh, you know, Yol works out probably more than anybody. I mean, he's uh, just the guy is a genetic freak mm-hmm. and has great work ethic. He just uh, you know. The travel. I forgot what was the actual because I knew he did a new nutritionist. Well, How it was he, short camp. That's right. Remember, I mean, that's he didn't have what. His full, yeah, I yeah. mean, and that's and kind he, of a legitimate excuse. I mean, we, it isn't like the guy's he's a big walking, dude. He, he yeah, cuts, I mean, the yeah. guy cuts a lot of weight, uh, yeah. and the fact he took the fight on short notice, I think you know, hey, you got to give the guy. Yeah. I think you give people a pass on a situation like that. If it had been Kelvin Gastelum. Who or you know Anthony Johnson, who've notoriously missed weight many times in their yeah. career, well, well then you know the short camp thing becomes kind of a you know ambient background noise. Yeah. Whereas in, in Yoel's part, I think absolutely still deserves a title shot. He already has been punished because he's not the interim champ, which cost him money. Uh, he lost a percentage of his purse by missing weight, and he also I mean it's not a lot of money, but I mean had he won the title, the Reebok pay would have went to championship pay, which I think is, you know, 30 grand or whatever it is, you know, compared mm-hmm. to his, you know, I think he gets 15 grand or something. So, I mean, you know, he took a hit. He's been punished, you know, for the mistake that was made. And it's an understandable mistake. Shit, man, short camp, you know, the guy didn't show up with a belly. He wasn't like he, the guy was ripped still to the bone and he just couldn't make, uh, didn't have enough time to prepare properly. Uh, still had a phenomenal performance. He wins. I think he's already been punished. The dues uh, have been paid. And, and now I think that he, he rightfully so gets a title shot at Whitaker to redeem that loss. This uh, Chicago card is shaping up. Uh, in addition to that being the rumored uh, main event, uh, you've got, how about this one? Curtis Blades. We talked about yeah. Curtis Razor Blades taking on Alistair Overeem. Oh, that's a good fight, man. Interesting. Yeah, that's a solid fight for both guys. I mean, uh, you know, Alistair's a hard guy to take down. Mm-hmm. Vicious knees. Uh, Curtis is not to be careful of it. Uh, you know, but, uh, uh, I think I'm going to have to go with the veteran here in this one. Uh, Curtis Blades showed phenomenal wrestling, and you know he's, he's capable on his feet, but I don't know if he has the power to scare uh, Alistair into really not defending the takedown where he you know, level changes. I think Alistair just worried about not getting taken down. And with that, you know, he hits hard. I think he's the much more powerful and sharper striker. Uh, and so I think that, you know, I think, you know, coming off a loss, I'm going to go with uh, Alistair on this one. We're still a ways away from this card, but uh, just the quick overview. Joe Benavidez returns, taking on Sergio Pettis. Carla Esparza taking on Claudia Gedalia. Rashad Evans back in the cage, taking on Anthony Smith. And I build up to all of this because there is another rumor about this July Chicago card. Or did I say June? June Chicago card. His opponent... <laughs> Goes by the name, uh, goes by the initials TBA, but supposedly, maybe, rumored, CM Punk returning to the UFC octagon in his hometown of Chicago. Now, this is defying my Hunger Games rule. I came out in qualified favor of CM Punk's fight in the octagon. A lot of people were totally against this. I said that it should be like... How many? Do you know this, Mikey? What the? What? How? How many? Uh, what's the year interval for Hunger Games? They do it every five years or ten years. I don't something? know that off the top of my head. Whatever that is, where they sacrifice the villagers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It should. I. I said once a decade. What should happen is, we should take one uh, uh, celebrity who has a passion for MMA, 
and we put them in the UFC octagon. Now, I don't care if they don't know about it ahead of time. I mean, maybe it's just, you know, mandated in Trump's America that we just pluck them up. You know, maybe it's Demi Lovato. You know, she <laughs> challenges Amanda Nunez. I don't know. I think she's got her blue belt now. Something like that. But no more than once every 10 years, okay? I'm, I'm not a savage. I'm just saying we see it once a decade just to remind us of uh, the, the, the true skill level of the mixed martial artist. But this would be twice in two years. Yeah. This is too much for me. Well, I, I like the idea. I think it's uh, it's good. I think it's a reminder because I think sometimes when people watch professional athletes, professional fighters going, in their mind, they're like, okay, that's 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 normal. Like, I would look like that too if I jumped in there and yeah. stopped drinking beer for a couple of weeks and, you know, hit the gym, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know mean, for you a half know, hour serious. before work, get my bench yeah. press back up to, you know, two plates. Yeah. And it's like, not even in your wildest dreams, buddy. Yeah. You know I mean, like, you know, and so seeing someone like CM Punk out there perform, I think it's a wake up call to a lot of other fighters out there, or people that think that they could fight. It's like, it gives them respect when they sit there and watch a guy and go, oh, what's he doing? I'm like, because the other guy is really good too. And that's why this is turning out this way. I know it sucks. It's not entertaining. But sometimes when you get two really good fighters in there, they can nullify each other's strengths. And so CM Punk, who has access to the, some of the best training in the world, but because he doesn't have the experience and the background and some other form of combat to help him out, that's why we've seen the performance that he had. Uh, you know, he, he's just not very good. And and if it wasn't for the fact that he's famous as all hell because of professional wrestling, uh, he would never make it to a UFC, Bellator, ACB level. He's just not anywhere. And he's not even in the zip code. Now, he was demolished by Mickey Gall in his debut and however many seconds that took. Now, Mickey Gall has turned no, out not a, to be a one-hit no, wonder. No, he's I mean, a he's, decent fighter. Yeah, he's a decent fighter. So, obviously, it's going to have, if CM Punk did come back, it would have to be somebody below the skill set, uh, skill level of Mickey Gall. But there that's again, the that's the argument we've problem. already had. Yeah. Once you get into the top shows, yeah. you know, you're not going to face competition of that a guy is just not that good. Uh, it's just because, I mean, what do you do? You sign somebody from an amateur show that only has a few fights and just, you know, he's a one-off pro and then he's going to go out there and now it's an even match. He might win, you know, even if you grab a guy on that level that could be mm -hmm. at a tough enough, you know, here in Vegas in an amateur show or here on the real water, you know, real MMA. Uh, we can grab a guy on that level and, and put him in there against CM Punk. But now, that guy wins because now they're evenly matched, yeah. or you see him wins. But now, what do you do with that guy? You know what I mean? Like, my guess who are you is, supposed to match CM Punk against yeah. that he can actually have a legitimate shot where it's even? My guess is that now it would be somebody they would pull off a Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series. But even that could be dangerous. Yeah. I mean, he found Gall on that looking for a fight mm -hmm. uh, show he was doing, and I, I would say that there are guys like I mean. Sean O'Malley, who it would be, he's, he's, I mean, CM Punk's heavier than him, but just I'm thinking about standouts who have come off of that show. Right now, Sean O'Malley would be light years ahead of the skill yeah. level of CM well, Punk. Well, I mean, and, and that was the thing afterwards, too. I'm like, who thought that Mickey Gall would have been a good fight for? Yeah. Because <laughs> when you sit there and go, hey, hey, this guy's actually a solid brown belt in jujitsu. Yeah. The guy's really good on the ground, uh, you know, and has a decent stand up. And then I thought CM Punk was going to be pretty good at grappling. Because you see him move around and stand up, he's stiff. It just, he's just not very good mm -hmm. at that either. And then so I thought, okay, well, you know, I've heard that he's trained jujitsu for years. You know, in between, he's not even a blue belt in jujitsu. He's got his blue belt now. Well, I but mean, he didn't when he yeah. fought the first time. And yeah. it was, uh, I mean, he started. I mean, some of the mistakes he was making, you're watching him like, wow, those are mistakes guys make as an amateur. Which yeah. really, that's what he is. He's an amateur. He just, because of his star power, gotten this opportunity to fight there. And it's like... The problem is... It's, that a, it's he was, a circus show. And the problem is he was doing it in the UFC. Yeah. He could have taken this to some regional show. And a decent regional show. Mm -hmm. I mean, he could have fought in Legacy, RFA, one of those kind of mm -hmm. things. And, you know, even if it was a somewhat favorable matchup in terms of giving him somebody that he's competitive against, I don't think it would have gotten nearly the blowback that this did. But at the same time, it drew a lot of ratings. And guess what? That's why he's always going to be able to yep. fight. And, and the UFC has especially gone down that route. I think that Conor McGregor has, for you know, he's done a lot more good for the sport than bad. But one of the things that he's done is that, you know, especially with the WM, you know, G guys buying it, mm -hmm. is they're an entertainment business. So they're looking at matchups that are entertainment value 
way more heavily than fight value. Whereas, you know, the Fertitas are, are fight fans. So, yes, they had to sell tickets and balance out the fact of guys being, you know, uh, entertaining. But they, you know, they matched it first and foremost. The guys are ferocious fighters, you know, first. But it seems like in this new era with the new ownership, you know, you're seeing guys like the CM Punk is going to have a home. Uh, if somebody else like Brad Pitt wanted to fight, he'll get a fight in the UFC <laughs> instantly. Yeah. Um, that's why, I mean, you see the argument made now. I mean, that should never have happened. George St. Pierre should not have been able to come out of retirement and get a title shot at the middleweight championship of the world. He wasn't even ranked, got to skip over everybody who worked hard, but because it made entertainment value, that outweighed fight value. Yeah. So, I mean, they're all about more show and less fight. You know what I mean? Like, that's, yeah. that's what they do. And, uh, you know, I think that can work in the short run, but as far as the legitimacy of the sport that the Fertitas spent 15 years building up, they're going to hack at that until they see that, hey, look, the needle's moving the wrong direction. Um, you can't keep doing that because then it becomes, you know, I mean, if that was the way to go, then celebrity death bo or, uh, boxing matches would would still be a thing that everybody wants to see. The, those work every now and then where you mm -hmm. get to go see Tanya Hardy fight, you know, or, you know, uh, Joey, you know, Baraducci. Those are one-off things that can be entertaining, but I don't think you're going to get people wanting to be invested and watch. You know, that's uh, you know, it's the Oscars. Every once in a while, we'll see it, but it can't be all the time. Speaking of Tanya Harding, her life story is uh, currently in theaters. It's called "I Tanya." It uh, garnered an Academy Award uh, a few weeks ago at the Oscars, and uh, I got up extra early this morning to visit with one of the stars of the film. He plays Tanya's bodyguard, Sean Eckhart, in the movie. Paul Walter Hauser was uh, my guest, and I uh, talked with him on the phone earlier this morning. Here's a few minutes of that interview. Paul Walter Hauser joining me now. He plays the role of Sean Eckhart in uh, the movie I, Tanya, which uh, is in theaters. Allison Janney won the uh, Best Supporting Actress Oscar for playing the role of Tanya Harding's mom. And uh, Paul joins me now. Paul, uh, good to talk to you, man. I, uh, first of all, thoroughly enjoyed this movie. Uh, secondly, lived it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm old enough that I, I remember all of this uh, happening, so it's always kind of interesting uh, uh, to, to age enough to where you start seeing these infamous incidents of your youth uh, play out on the big screen. But I know you're, uh, you're a little bit younger than that. You were probably like seven, eight years old when all this happened. So let me just ask you first, did you have any prior awareness uh, of the story to getting the role and, and, and whether or not you did, what, what was the process in uh, learning about it once you were cast? You know, I didn't know all that much. You're, you're right. I was, I was in about second grade or something. And, and for me, it was a lot of snapshot imagery of, of uh, Nancy crying and, and clutching her leg and, uh, and everybody walking around in cuffs being taken to court. It was more of that type of thing. I didn't know much. But what I, what I did know is that this story has such a dual relevance for both being a, a sports scandal, you know, in the world of sports, especially regarding the Olympics. It's such a big story. But it's also sort of just this, notorious, uh, you know, crime of idiocy. Yeah. So it kind of lives in these two worlds and, and really, uh, reading the screenplay, it did, it did both. It was both informative of the, of the issues at hand, but it was also very entertaining, which I think that's what everyone was tuning in for. It was, yeah. This is a very entertaining story, albeit a difficult one. Yeah. And you know, when you, when you talk about that, that crime of idiocy, I mean, you, you got the distinction as, as, as being cast of, as one of the prime idiots, uh, uh, with, with Sean's character. And, and I know Sean died, uh, like 10 years ago, so there was no opportunity to interview him or anything like this for the, for the role, but he did leave us some great footage. And, and I recall watching that footage back when it, when it first aired and uh, uh, these these interviews that he did where he was uh, in his mind, this sort of international double agent type, you know, spy uh, guy. But in reality, was kind of was kind of living in, in mom's basement. 
Um, what, did you get a chance to to talk to anybody uh, or be around anybody that was in any way associated with that case, or did you build that amazing character you played just off of that that footage? Well, to to be frank, you know the screenplay was so detailed yeah. that you get a lot of contextual clues about the character based on both the humor and sort of the darkness laced within that story. So the script really does do a lot of the work if you break it down. But but for me, I did watch that Diane Sawyer interview ad nauseum. And, you know, I'm one of these people, I don't know if you're like this, Richard, I am, but, but I love people watching, right? And oh, I yeah. kind of make up stories, or I, I find little quirks or nuances about people, and I sort of... Uh, I sort of tell my own story in my mind of what I think this person's life is. So, uh, yeah, really, really sort of digging into the context and bloviating details that I think are interesting or vital. And uh, I did, I did contact a man by the name of Eugene Saunders, and Eugene is now a, I think, a theological professor at a Bible college in Portland. But back in the day, he went to college with Sean. He took a class or two with Sean, mm. and I, I found him and contacted him. And uh, we spoke, and he, he was able to divulge the information that, that led to him turning Sean into the FBI. So that, that was very, very helpful, that I, I had sort of a voice from Sean's past to inform some of my choices. Yeah, and this is one of these stories that just, if, if you don't already know the background of what Paul and I are talking about, or maybe you just know the skeleton details, it really is one of these, uh, you know, just almost too bizarre to be believed, except it really was true. These were all real people, particularly your role about this, with this film, Paul, because I got to tell you, before I went in to see this, I was excited to see, I knew the story and everything, and, and people were telling me, boy, this guy that plays Sean Eckhart really steals every scene he's in and and that is totally true i mean this is sort of to the point that this is like your uh your carl and sling blade paul i mean people may be asking you to do this character <laughs> on the street 10 years from now are you uh are you okay with that i'm okay with it man as long as i don't have anywhere to be i don't <laughs> mind uh doing the photos or the sharpie thing or the impersonation also you know i'm a fanboy myself as far as uh, when I see people in the streets, I've stopped them and uh, and just fanned out, and they've been very gracious and and cool. And uh, and this is one of those characters that just I think it's going to help my career quite a bit. It already has, and I think uh, I, I definitely lucked out or blessed out when it came to getting to play Sean. Were you surprised with? Because I'll tell you one thing that did surprise me about the film, as much as I already knew about the story, and and yeah, I mean at the at the root of it, it 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 is uh, it is it is tragic because you know a, a, an innocent person was assaulted, but there is a lot of dark humor in and around the the uh, the Keystone Cops element of of planning the crime. But what did surprise me that I had not really considered going into the film was how the 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 world of of figure skating was really kind of vilified the the hierarchy of it and the snobbery of it and the way that Tanya Harding simply because of her position in our class system was really looked down upon and and shut out despite her superior uh, skill level uh, have, have you gotten that reaction from other people that you go see the film and as mad as you are at the guy for hitting Nancy Kerrigan with the club you're also looking at this governing body of figure skating going wow you know they they didn't really help themselves here by by creating this this class system of envy yeah you know it's so funny it's so funny where you ever go to one of those uh, like little league games or some low stakes sporting event that usually involves youth and you see one or two parents who get a little too into it. Oh, like yeah. they're actually upset. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I think that that's all this is. This is, these are cases of people who, uh, take something to, with too much severity and too much, um, and too much weight. And I think the, the figure skating world, uh, it's a lot about grace and presentation and it doesn't have that same Pop Warner Football League type of thing. It, it's a whole different world that's really it's very visual, and, and it cost, it does cost money. So I can see where those, those divisions would be put up, uh, almost like in a church setting. Church isn't supposed to be about judgment. It's supposed to be like, hey, we're all here to sing songs because we're broken people who love God, but also a church is a setting in which you know things can occasionally be... Uh, perverted and and change and i i think like the skating world has that yeah. uh, stigma now that people have seen what happens 
Yeah, it's an amazing byproduct of uh, the film. It's called I, Tanya. Paul Walter Hauser plays the role of Tanya Harding's bodyguard, Sean Eckhart. A fantastic movie. Uh, it's uh, still in theaters now. You can get out there and go see it. Paul, really enjoyed uh, the film, the role you played, and uh, looking forward to seeing you on the screen again. And uh, appreciate your time this morning. Congratulations on a fantastic film. Thank you, Richard. We appreciate you guys giving us a shout. Frank joining us on the Skype screen right now, all the way from Bisbee, Arizona. It is uh, our I buddies. Miss I miss Bisbee already myself. Uh, I gotta get back, man. That's right. I need more volume on Frank, by the way. There, that's uh, uh, all the way from Bisbee, inside of Doug Stanhope's uh, Fun House in Bisbee, Arizona. It is Joby Whitlock and Chad Shank. From the Doug Stanhope podcast and the Doug Stanhope Celebrity Death Pool. Good to see you guys. How are you? Doing good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, on. great to see you guys too. I see the bar is open for business and it looks like it's Bingo Shift. Is she back yeah. there tending bar? Hi, Bingo. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Bingo's book, by the way, was a big hit in my house. Oh, was just, it? Yeah, a little, little plug for Bingo's book. Cool. Yeah. Jennifer really enjoyed it, and I'm, I'm next to uh, read it. Oh, okay, so we'll, when you're done, we'll, let me know. Pass our copy around. Yeah, nice job there, Bingo. It's the only thing Thank we pass around. So much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How's uh, how's everything going there in Bisbee? The uh, the 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 cult leader is uh, is away, right? He's he's out on international business, which is most cult leaders don't travel internationally. But Doug is off doing some some business. Where where is he these days? Thailand or something? <laughs> yeah. Uh, where is he at? Is he uh, Vietnam now? I think that's what they Yeah, yeah. Vietnam. I think he's in Vietnam now. Yeah. So. And that's not a joke. He's really in Vietnam. Like I saw pictures on uh, social media. He was over there smoking in Vietnam, which apparently is still very popular in that part of the <laughs> I world. I can imagine so they probably smoke still in restaurants. I think they do smoke quite a bit over there, so he's, he's probably feeling pretty comfortable. All right. Now, it is that time of the month again. Uh, for those of you who play in our celebrity death pool, and by the way, now there's about twice as many of you as there were last month because we have the phone booth fighting celebrity death pool league. Uh, about 100 of you play in that. And then about another 70 of you are playing in our supergroup death pool league that we're doing with Doug Stanhope's crew, which is called Damn Yankees. And you can find both of those at Doug Stanhope's celebrity death pool.com. And by the way, uh, if you missed out playing with us, you can always sign up. Anytime during the year, you can create your own league, play along with your friends and whatnot. But uh, if you're playing with us, then uh, you know that we are involved in some high-stakes competition. Uh, <laughs> Joby, before we uh, give a, a trade round update, because I know the, the uh, trade round uh, 24-hour window is about to open up, just give everybody a refresher course if they missed our last episode with you guys about what's on the line here for uh, uh, those competing with us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, first place, uh, we have a, a issue of Playboy featuring China. Yes. The uh, uh, not-so-recently-deceased China. Deceased celebrity. Deceased celebrity. Uh, and it will be signed by Frank Mir, Doug Stanhope, Richard Hunter, Chad Shank and myself. Yes. And then on top of that, we'll be giving away uh, Amazon gift card, about a hundred buck, hundred dollar Amazon gift card. Second place is Amazon gift card and merch. And I think it should be whoever wins second place and third place because third place gets merch as well. They can choose between phone booth fighting or Stanhope stuff or both. You know what? We're just we're in for all of it. So just we'll we'll, we'll combine with whatever you. Uh, you, yeah. you, you won. I would hate for it to turn ugly with somebody uh, picking uh, one favorably over the other. You well, know, you know, we can also, as far as uh, struck an idea, uh, I'm speaking on the air here, guys, SARS, and I know Doug okay. needs to be having put on this, but what if also, too, it was a spot of coming out and hanging out at Doug's when all four of us or five of us are together again? Oh, interesting. Perfect. I mean, that could be a big one. I mean, you know, hey, I mean, you've got to take care of your own flight and get down there, but, right. you know, I'm inviting people to Doug's house. I'm that asshole of a friend now. Well, no, here's the thing. Of of That's the fired uh, before. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, but what I was gonna say, Chad, is 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 of the two actual bona fide celebrities between these two podcasts, Doug is the only one who publishes who uh, 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 publishes his home address. Nobody knows exactly. what Frank's home address is. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's actually not a bad idea. And uh, we've kicked it around before in the past of uh, uh, having that as a first place prize is 
hey, you know, make your own way, but you get to come down and, yeah. and hang out. So, yeah. um, so Frank, you're you're on to something. We've we've kicked it around before, and yeah, let's uh, let's kick it around with Doug when he if he gets back from Vietnam and he's not on heroin. Yeah, or when he gets back and he's on heroin. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Just give him a smaller dose. Keep him straight. No. Might be more agreeable at that point. Yeah, usually hey, people are easier going when they're also before we get into the, the uh, monthly uh, trade round update here uh, for you fantasy death pool players i gotta tell you frank i don't know if you uh heard on the uh doug stanhope podcast but uh the dude who bought the uh the house finally showed up oh he did house had been painted pink camouflage right yep yeah Yeah, absolutely he he absolutely adores it i he i think he's gonna keep it that's awesome that's the best way to ride that yeah 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 yeah, absolutely adorable. Did you guys get to see his response when he first showed up, or did he show up and go, what the fuck? And you guys got to see the aftermath. Uh, he, I think he drove by at night uh, and didn't think it was his house. <laughs> <laughs> and then had That's to even better. back. Yeah. So, so he absolutely loved it. Yeah, it was, it was a good hit. So. You got to enjoy that. I mean, because I mean, that wasn't just a practical joke that took 30 seconds. I mean, right. that <laughs> took some time, love, and effort, you know? You know, yeah, I absolutely. I will say this uh, uh, about you guys down there that 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 fun pack you have, and uh, and I'll say this about Doug. I know Doug's latest book is called uh, the, uh, "This Is Not Fame," but to tell you the truth, that little snapshot, that example, guys, is to me what success in life is all about. If you've just done well enough for yourself that you can afford on a whim. To paint your buddy's house pink camouflage <laughs> just, just, right. just to entertain you and your friends. I mean, what more in life could any of us ever really want? I hope someday, you know, because there's plenty of I hope, too, that you, our podcast is so successful you can paint my house. Yes, I know. There's exactly. There's, there's plenty of people who think of jokes like that and go, oh, that would be really cool. It's great to be at a place in your life where you just, you just go, it shall be done. Yes. You know, yeah. <laughs> All right, Joby, get us up to speed. Chad, get us up to speed on uh, what's going on with Celebrity Death Pool. Now, I'm looking at my countdown clock here at Doug Stanhope, CelebrityDeathPool.com. I see we're one day, six hours, 16 minutes, and 44, 43, 42 seconds away from the trade window opening. That is where what for new players? Everybody has a 24-hour window to do what, guys? Yeah, to uh, drop a player, if, uh, if they've got cancer and they're getting healthy, mm-hmm. fuck it, drop them. Get someone that's sick. Yep. So, uh, yeah, if you don't like your uh, any one of your team, you know, you just get one trade per round and uh, drop them and pick someone else up. So who, who are you looking at for next trade round? Uh, I probably... I have I have to pick the funeral homes for who I what I want yeah. to trade around because like the one that we're just doing the damn Yankees I only did musicians so far so mm-hmm. I've got to find a musician and uh, we should uh, explain to trade out but uh, mu- I actually have no idea yet actually while you're doing this can you log me in on my phone so I yeah can watch? we we should explain uh, by the way guys musicians are a 25 point bonus category in and of themselves this year yes yes, yes. yes. and so that's why uh, Chad took all musicians. Well, I'll, I'll, I forgot to ask this though. But Richie, do you count a musician? I mean, because you I mean you did have many years. Uh, I did, but I believe are in you the big I, enough as a musician. No, in the in the pool, I'm listed as like a uh, a broadcaster. Or I think. Okay, that's your. I think I did get a comedian credit. Well, yeah, because you've won titles. At yeah, it. exactly. I'm. I've, I was elected Reno's funniest comedian two years in a row. For anyone Man, who's paying attention, I can't wait till that becomes a target. Because that. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, next year, maybe next year. Comedians. Yeah. Comedians. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of trade rounds, um, you know, I and this this is this is how cruel Celebrity Death Pool will treat you. You'll be you know ten days away from a trade round, and you'll see a notification that Rick Ross has collapsed. And you think to yourself, okay, just hang on long enough for me to get to the trade window. But then, trade window comes, guess who's feeling better? Rick Ross. Saw a picture yeah. of him out with his kids or something like that. And I'm like, oh, yeah. fuck it. Now i got to think of somebody else. Well, <laughs> I tell you what, Joby, if you can, give everybody just an overview, maybe on our Damn Yankees League and also our Phone Booth Fighting League, on how uh, our listeners are doing, because I think four or five of them now have actually uh, gotten on the scoreboards. Yeah, actually, phone booth fighting, uh, you've got uh, one guy that, that 
came out of the gate. He's got 104 points already. Roly poly fish heads. What did he do? So, Damn, that's a uh, strong lead already. I think uh, uh, Noki Edwards. He got that hit. Yeah, no, Noki Edwards, yeah. Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. That was one that was flying under the radar. Sometimes a lot of these guys are like uh, they, yeah, Billy Graham. I mean, who recently passed away finally. But it was like, I mean, as long as I've been playing Death Pool, that guy's been turning up on rosters. And some of these, some of these bastards just won't go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I'll get to Wait, Billy we forgot Graham a little bit later. Or yeah, that's yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. a big one. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So so no, he he scored with Noki Edwards. Uh, who who else uh, who else on there? And it, there, there, he he probably did well too because there's a first blood bonus. So if you're the first person right. in the league uh, in the season to score, there's a bonus on top of that as well, right? Uh, yes, I think. Let me let me check out and see if he got first blood. But I don't know. I think that one's not coming up. Um, he had uh, Vic Damone. Oh yes, crooner yeah. Vic Damone. Vic Damone, um, and that was his two hits. So the next guy, Steve MC, he's at 89 points. Uh, Fane of Mats is at 86. So you got uh, Doug Stanhope's prostate is at uh, fourth place, sitting at 85 points. I just like that name. It's a That's great a good name. name. What's Doug Stanhope's but, prostate doing on the on the board? Who'd he score with? Let's see what he's got. All right, he has got he had uh, oh Morgan San Giriel, uh, Giri, uh the he was Zimbabwe politician. Oh okay, uh, he, he taunted the bucket recently. So Boy, prime minister of Zimbabwe. Yeah, last uh, year's bonus category, by the way, was politicians. Yeah, and that was a bitch of a category because I mean you want to talk about discovering scared, yeah. names that you, you had no idea who these people are, especially on an international level. I mean, yeah. Most people barely follow after the president. You know, right. you say who's Secretary of State? The average U.S. So I, I don't want to throw us all under the bus, but yeah, 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 shit, man. I mean, some people don't know who. I mean, if I sit there and go, "Hey, who's the governor of such and such?" You know, mm-hmm. like their own state. So let alone who's like, you know, like, hey, who's uh, you know, running pr- uh, the premier of, you know, no one knows. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, that that just shows you do your due diligence. You dig deep enough, uh, you're gonna find some gems in there. And and Chad, was it you? I, I was looking over the roster. Somebody scored with Billy Graham, but it it was worth one point because yeah. he was 99 years old. It's a hundred points minus your age. But somebody took him in a, uh, a bonus, uh, uh, got the bonus because he was a solo pick in that solo. league. Was that you? I can't remember. No, that wasn't me, it was but it's else. a decent strategy. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where it backfires, though. And uh, if you're playing in our uh, damn Yankees league, you see what happened to me. I took uh, uh, Kurt Douglas thinking <laughs> – that if I was the only one, right? Yeah. I kind of suspected you were going to do that because we all kind of talked about that. Yeah, like, hey, that's actually a strategy. If you pick somebody, yeah, that you get no bonuses for age, but you're the only one that gets them because no one else wants them. Well, here's the problem: he's a hundred years old now, right, or one hundred one or something like that. Yeah, so one hundred one. Yeah, I got to dump him right away yeah. because if Jesus, he, you, I'm just looking at your list here. You got Carol Channing. She's like ninety seven or ninety eight. Yeah. 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 Those are where the trade rounds come in good. You take a gamble on those, and yeah. hoping nobody else will have them. Yeah. But if they do, you just pump them out on the fifteenth and put somebody else in. Well, that's true, Chad. But what you got to do is you got to hope that they have a good couple of weeks in the meantime, because <laughs> that, you know, leave it to Kirk Douglas to decide that this is going to be the time to check out. Hey, has that ever happened to you guys? Or you can think of notably that you had somebody, you carried them, and you dropped them, and then all of a sudden they hit. Ooh. Oh yeah, I did yes. that with uh, I did that with Manson last year. Mm-hmm. Oh. I dropped Manson and uh, and yeah, and he he kicked off like a month later. What yep. about yours? I, mine was a few years back. I had one of the uh, whack pack from the Howard Stern show, Eric the Midget. Oh uh, yeah, who was a young guy? Yeah, not and old. I had him as a solo pick, and yeah. he died the oh. month after I dropped him off. That hurts. Yeah, because that'd have been at least what seventy five points. You know, what I mean, yeah, yeah. 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 <sighs> By the way, apropos of uh, nothing other than a random Eric the Midget uh, uh, reference by Chad Shank there, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll bring this with me for my private collection next time I'm uh, down in Bisbee. But I have a photo of Air Force Amy fucking Eric the Midget 
at, oh, at the Bunny yes. Ranch. It uh, it looks like I mean I I, I it's the I, I worry that you know in in the haste of some sort of government investigation it could be mistaken for child pornography because it does look <laughs> like she's fucking an infant. It's really <laughs> horrific. Oh, that's yeah. funny. That's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. that's. Yeah, I got to check it out and then uh, shy away from the view. Yes, so. yes. That's yes. one of those things you're like, I don't want to look, but I have to. You have to. Like right yeah. now, I'm like, bro, come on. I got to yeah. see that. You yeah, know? yeah. you would have to see it. <laughs> I won't be able to unsee it, but I can't yeah. not, not look at yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously, in, in, in my case, I'm dumping uh, uh, Kirk Douglas post-haste here, and I got to pick up somebody. Give us an overview, uh, uh, Joby. Yeah. Who are maybe some of the uh, the blue chippers out there? Who are some of the who are some okay. of the uh, celebrities whose stocks may be on the rise when it comes to uh, I'll, mortality? I'll do the uh, uh, who people are dropping. Oh, okay, good one. First. Yeah, yeah, your segment. And, yeah, um, starting at number ten, Willie Nelson. People are dropping him. Dropping him. Okay. John McCain, which I'm surprised people are dropping him. How much of this do you think is, if I can inject a question here, Joby, you, you guys are the experts. How much of this do you think it, you can um, attribute to successful PR campaigns? Because I know with John McCain, what happens is he'll tweet or his wife will tweet, you know, tough son of a bitch, you know, the, the, the Viet Cong couldn't break him and neither is death. You know, he's not going anywhere. How much of that kind of thing do you think uh, uh, sways the public sentiment? What do you think? There's a learning curve to it where you you might buy it for a little while as a rookie, <laughs> but as you, uh, as you start to learn, you know when to disregard it or when they're blowing smoke, a smoke screen to cover something up. And, uh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, almost yeah. like they're uh, protesting too much, if yeah. you will. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Joby. So John McCain there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Eddie Olchick, hockey player. Mm -hmm. uh, Vera Lynn. Oh, now I have. Wait a minute. I have uh, Vera Lynn in mm -hmm. my uh, my invite only league, but she's one that I got to keep a real close eye on because I think she's ninety nine. Yep. People, yeah. wait a minute. Are you telling me? By the way, I love the fact that you're just smoking a cigarette while we're while we're <laughs> we're, yeah. we're talking. You're yeah. just giving death the finger, aren't you? While we're, yeah, while we're doing this all the same. Hey, now, now, uh, isn't so? So she, you're saying people are dropping her? Is it people are going? Hey, she. It's not close to her birthday, is it? I wonder if that's the problem. No, um, you know, and that's another good strategy. Is to, you know, if, if you're holding on to someone who's especially old, but. It passes her birthday, and she's not a solo pick. Screw it, drop her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's not bad. Who else? Who else are they so, dropping? Uh, Fred Ottman. Uh, he was a professional wrestler. Okay. He was a professional wrestler back in his day. Um, uh, Aaron Appfield, author. I don't know who that is, honestly. Uh, Kirk Douglas. People are kicking right. him because they're they're now we're getting into. Okay, they're realizing he's going to bring them negative points, or they're solo picks, or, probably, or not solo picks. Yeah, probably a lot of people did that same thing I did, where they picked yep. him up, they found out that other people in the league took him, and they got to get rid of him. Now, a good handful of people, this is the next one, dropped Billy Graham six days before he died. Just in time. And so that's got to crush them, even though it's points you know it's not a lot of points but yeah yeah they dropped him right before he died yeah i mean i, I guess worst case he'd be worth a single he'd be worth <laughs> one point yeah not the most detrimental one yeah not like how exactly. chad's was that that one hurts right right yeah so uh then the last two are clive james mm -hmm. and Maisie hurano uh congressman from uh hawaii made the news quite a bit back in the day okay so by the way those I are the ones that are dropped the uh the ones that you're picking up are Terry Funk, you remember Terry? Yeah, Funk, the, the, the pro wrestler. Has he? Yeah. I mean, one thing about Mikey the lifted his head to that one. Oh yeah, yeah. He got, was Mikey? big in uh, ECW. Yes. He got the shit yep. kicked out of him. Barbed wire stabbed in him all the time. So yeah, I this see how uh, be. the voice of our yeah. producer, Mikey. Guys, uh, yeah, you know uh, the pro wrestlers. It is another rookie tip. Chad was bringing up, you know, uh, uh, rookie mistakes. But the pro wrestlers uh, are, as a profession are always a great pick, aren't they, guys? 
Yeah, always. Throw one on your list, man. Yeah, you got to. I mean, the question is, if you're playing Celebrity Death Pool and you don't have a pro wrestler on your roster, are you really playing in Celebrity well, Death Pool? <laughs> I mean, in all honesty, too, pro wrestling. I mean, you know more than I do about yeah. it because you, you worked in that industry. But, I mean, those guys work 300 days a year. They're all doing backflips, jumping yeah. around. I mean, people will sit there and go, well, it's not real. I'm like, okay, yeah, the outcome is not is predetermined. Yeah. But they're still getting hit with chairs, twists and shit. I mean, it's like they're, they're in a car wreck every day. Yeah, they're doing stuntman mm-hmm. work 300 mm-hmm. days a year. And so mm-hmm. then all of a sudden they have to take pain medication. I was going to say, you know what else? Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. they're doing things to help soup their body up because yeah. they need to show up for work. You know, where yep. you, know, you have a bad back. It's like, oh, you know, I'm going to take the day light. You know, it's like. No, you got to go out there and now go pick up a three hundred pound man and suplex yeah. him, and you know, and, and do that for fifteen minutes. And we're going to do it again tomorrow after you get on a plane. And yeah. those guys, I, I think that physically that might be the most damaging career I can think of, as yeah. far as hard on your body. Yeah, yeah. Uh, One of those three years, I think it was. I think they might have been even a bonus for wrestlers that year. Yeah. But uh, Joby had Jake the Snake, uh, yeah, Roberts. Yep, and I had the. Uh, was a Scott Hall. Oh, uh, yeah. Boy, you well, guys. both those guys those before. Bitches moved in with Diamond Dallas. Yeah, he screwed you. He, he coffin up. blocked you. We're on death's door when yep. we picked them up. Yeah, because yeah, even watching the resurrection of uh, yeah, Jake Roberts. Yoga and, yeah, yeah when you saw those people. guys, those guys are definitely picks yeah. for <laughs> before that. They look like they're. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe they were still alive. You know, <laughs> you, you know, you know. We're uh, we're we're on this show here, guys. We're we're friends with Diamond Dallas Page, yeah. and he would be so pumped to find out that he had fucked you like that. Yeah. I mean, I next time he he might be the biggest it. coffin blocker. Yeah. There is, as yeah. far as like rehabilitating and turning people's lives around. Yeah, it's the worst, probably you know, entertainment business in the world as far as injuries and 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 you know, uh, having an early death. Yeah. is pro wrestlers. Yeah, and this is the one asshole out there fucking redeeming them and fixing them up. You know, yeah, like, you, you know what? You I don't want your that. guy on your list to be friends with him. You're like, no, no! you no. see a Instagram <laughs> pic, you're like, fuck, I'm dropping him. You know what yeah. I you know what I would do speaking of uh, discretionary income if if I had you know like the the Doug Stanhope money to paint uh, people's houses pink what I would do is I would use that discretionary money to hire Diamond Dallas Page as a consultant. What I would do is I would look on your rosters oh. to see who your celebrities were, and then I would pay for him to then turn the lives around of your celebrities. That seems like that could be really costly after a while, but I would do it. real costly. It seems to me if rule one says that I can't kill any of my picks, I don't think people should be allowed to save my picks. There's some sort of... Well, uh, you got Coffin Blocker, the most famous one right here. I I maintain... Oh, that's right. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. Until... There that's is, what you guys who came up with the term coffin blocker. I think, I think yeah, was Joby. Joby. yeah, yeah, that's the best term I've heard so far. Yeah. Coffin blocker, and you're the king coffin blocker. That's right. When I revive Lamar Odom, I I maintain unless somebody else has another example out there that I'm the only combatant in the history of celebrity death pool who has actively worked to preserve the mm-hmm. life of somebody who was on you a have competitor's be, roster. You have to be the only player that's actually saved someone's life. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'll, yeah. I'll take it. I'll claim credit. You, for you and Diamond Dallas Page are the two biggest coffin <laughs> blockers. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, so who else? Is, are there? Is there any? Them. Yeah, is there anybody else out there? Like I mentioned, uh, Rick Ross earlier. Somebody who maybe wasn't on people's right because sometimes these things come out of nowhere. That's what you got to watch out for. Is all of a sudden somebody that's not on anybody's radar all of a sudden is in. Uh, dire straits and you know you immediately check the calendar to see how far away you are from the 15th is there anybody out there like that uh guys oh i don't know um i haven't had anybody come up on my radar recently i've got some in my in my pick list that to go through but yeah i'll look right up until trade round day though i mean i found them on trade round day yeah, if you use the right search terms. You can just start finding news articles from yeah, around a, the world. I guess because yeah. we asked the question, have you ever made the mistake of dropping someone that passed away? Yes. Has a trade round ever came to where all of a sudden, you know, they're in a horrific accident, they're on life support, and it's like, oh, it's the fourteenth. Shit, yeah, I got them. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, looking back, <clears throat> I mean, I've obviously done that, and then they pull through. It just doesn't work that way for me. So. 
Um, I remember the mad rush for everybody to pick up Bobby Christina Brown. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, was, yeah. That's I was right. part of that. I, I was yeah, part of that. She was on life support for God, like a, what a month or a month and a half. Yeah, yeah like, like brain so, dead too. Like yeah. I mean, there was no, a, I, you know what? That the, I, I was part of that uh, that rush because what happened was she wasn't on anybody's roster, so yeah. that meant you could get her, but you had to get her quick. And I, I don't know how many of us picked her up. That what killed me about that, though, uh, so to speak, was uh, <laughs> of 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 that immediate family, uh, Whitney Houston. Bobby Brown and Bobby Christina Brown. Yeah. Two of them are dead. Guess who I had on my roster at the time? <laughs> the one living one. I had Bobby Brown. Because remember the year where you got the bonus for the celebrity whose first and last name begin with the same letter? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, I, for that Bobby reason, Brown. I had Bobby Brown. And damned if he isn't the last one standing. Well, also, too, if you'd have yeah. told me in the 90s that. Yeah. That Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown are going to have a daughter. Yeah. And out of the three of them, who do you think's going to die first? You know, right, come on, dude, Bobby Brown. He's either right. going to get shot by somebody, or you know what I mean, or you know, at the, even in that time, we knew he was partying hard. Yes, I didn't know about Whitney Houston until you know, obviously, everybody else kind of found out. Like, holy shit, you know? Yeah, yeah. What do you guys think about this? This is a strategy, and I'll just, I'm just going to, you know, out myself on this because I'm about ready to give up on it by next season. <laughs> I when I started playing Depo, I don't know if you guys how much uh, you know recon you do on your competitors. If you guys have noticed my pattern here, but what I did was, and I was trying to moneyball this thing, Frank. You know, I was just trying to play the numbers. And when I looked at the bonus categories at Doug Stanhope Celebrity dot com, I realized that there is a uh, twenty five point. Uh, Whitney Houston bonus, which is the black celebrity who dies during Black History Month. So that's February. There was also a, what's the birthday bonus, the Pretty Boy Floyd bonus? If you die on your birthday, is it 50? Yeah, it's uh, Machine Gun Kelly. Machine Gun Kelly, sorry. Is it yeah. is it 50? It's more than 25, isn't it, I think? I think that's uh, 50. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I had this idea <clears throat> that what I would do at the beginning of every calendar year season is I would load up on black celebrities, okay. particularly black celebrities who had a February birthday. Oh, because that's a with, massive hit. With this pie-in-the-sky fantasy that one of them would pass on their February birthday, and I would just bury everybody else in the league by the second month of the year. What is the highest points anybody's ever... Do you guys happen to know that? Like, what is, with bonuses and age, what has been the record for the biggest kill? Great question for Death Pool historian Joby Whitlock. Oh, God, let's see. I think the the most points were, like, in the 150 range for one hit. Yeah. And that was, like, first blood and and a, a couple of different bonus points combined. I don't have that right with me, but it was in, like, 150 to 170 range. And I want to think the same guy might have won the all-time high record of points, which was like 1,100. That was like two seasons ago. Mm. So not only did he get like a single game rushing yard goal, but then he got the overall season. Yeah, most yeah. Yards. yeah, yeah. Cool. Look at that. Did you did you see that 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 look of awe and disbelief that just came over Chad Shank's face when Joe? I mean, I, just. I, I yeah. had a my first the first year I had a solo pick. She was 13 years old. Yeah, and I, that was the <laughs> biggest pick. I thought that would ever hit, and uh, uh, that's been obliterated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, Christ. yeah, some of these guys are taking it real seriously, obviously, Ooh. because they have money on the line. I mean, some of these guys have a lot of cash on the line, so they they do research. Who was that? By the way, I love the fact that we can play this, and as dark and disgusting as it is, every once in a while somebody will say something like what Chad just said about his 13-year-old, and we're like, oh, oh, my God, <laughs> sir. Okay. Please, how dare it you? A, it was a loophole. She shouldn't have been in there. It, she was like a YouTube vlogger oh. who uh, uh, was only famous because she was ill. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, since so, then, we've stopped that. Thank Somehow you. Somehow it slipped by <laughs> yes. Toby, and uh, a couple of us got grandfathered in with that one. Yeah, yeah. that's a... That's but a... I, I've had darker ones. I petitioned for a, a six-year-old with liver cancer that was an actor in the UK one year. Yeah, I remember that. And, uh, yeah. and I and I was glad that he pulled through, but 
if you don't, I've won some points, but I'm not. I'm not rooting for anybody to die. But I, you know, I love the caveat too. I love it when you try to cover it up a little bit by going, "Listen, I'm not. I, you know, we. I'm, I'm happy to I, lose I on this. I hope I lose. I, I hope mean, I, I, I hope I am. But the I mean, if, loser. if there has to be some silver lining to this tragedy, right? Right. <laughs> well, you know the the mantra the mantra of uh, the death pool is we're not hypocrites, and uh, Frank and I are both in the death yeah, pool. Yeah, I, I got mean, people I'm on their list. Man. We're candidates. Have I ever told? you i know we talked a lot about my brothel job when i was out there we were in uh bisbee by the way if you missed the swap cast that we did with with doug stanhope and joby and chad and the whole crew uh a couple episodes ago about a month ago now uh go back in our archives and listen That's it was probably my favorite episode we've done so far yeah it was, i think that i mean man doug just i think all of us it was it was just easy i mean yeah man if, i wish bisbee was next door to us because if we did that all that was it the most effortless podcast we've ever done. We're just, yeah. just sit there. It was the complete definition of just a bunch of guys drinking a beer and you just stuck a microphone in our face. I think that's true. Go back and listen to it okay. if you missed it. Do we yourself got a breaking favor. Breaking news here, guys. Uh oh. Breaking news during the celebrity death pool uh, segment. What's up, Joby? Stephen Hawking's just died. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, Did he really? Holy shit. Everyone blew up on that. Let me uh, hold on. <sighs> I think Frank has it. I think I do. Hold on. Let's see. Uh, uh, Everyone's looking at their phones. Son of a bitch. Let, I me, know uh, I let me find out how many people have him. I'm checking Frank's roster right now because he's not <laughs> logged in on his phone. You have him, sir. Yep. Frank Mir is on the board. <clears throat> Stephen Jeez. Hawking. Congratulations, Frank. I'm calling Stan Hope. All right. Let me see. <laughs> let me look this up real quick and see how many people have him. I know I did not. Uh, I didn't. No, I didn't either. 439 hits and 46 solos. What's he uh, born in uh, 1942? 76. Yep. So what's he worth there? 24. 76 would, yeah, it would be uh, 24 points. 24 it's, with no bonuses. Yeah, and 46 of those people that picked him up will have solos, so they're going to get 25 points. So. Yeah. All right, so Frank, for example, in uh, the Vulture Club pool, the invite-only league uh, that we play in with Doug. Uh, Does anybody else have him in ours? N good question. I'd, I'd have to go through and look, but what I can tell you is right now there are three people on the board, Chad, of course, being in first place, being one of them, and uh, you, Frank, will collect 24 points which will put you, if the uh, person in third place didn't have him, it'll put you uh, within uh, 30 points of uh, striking distance of uh, third place. Oh, cool. Right. Almost on the podiums. Wow. Yes. What were the odds of that? What were the yeah, odds me, of having um, breaking news? I'm going to go news? ahead and uh, input the death here right now, and then right. should I uh, – Let's see. What kind of cause of death should I put? Traffic collision, uh, karma. Let's see. What is what? Are, what's a fun one to put in? Oh. Old as fuck. Now he's not that old. So. <laughs> All right. So three thirteen twenty eighteen. All right, Chad. Uh, uh, All right. Joby is logging him in as we uh, as we speak. There. Well. Uh -huh. Okay. Congratulations to everybody but Stephen Hawking, I guess, in, in that scenario. <laughs> yeah, but um, for the illness yeah. that he had, he lived a long oh, time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he sure did. I mean, he. what I understood about him having that ALS is that he. you basically have to be uh, changing the filter on whatever machine he was on like every – few hours no, or yeah, something I mean, like that talk about i mean financially he yeah, had access yeah. And, and, yeah i mean but i mean to a point that i mean you know i know everybody heard him talk with the computer voice but that's because he had to he only had one muscle in his cheek that basically wasn't paralyzed and he was able to use that to type wow so he did these long out you know uh, extra uh, uh, you know uh, writings yeah uh it, it took forever you know yeah. and, and i always kind of wondered that like you know, quality of life to, you know, just for living for the sake of living. Like, I don't know, like, how long I could hold on like that, you know, to where you're just basically, you know, a cast in your own body. Like, I mean, that's, I mean, obviously that's for a deeper conversation we can all have. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I don't know what his mobility was, but I think he would have to wait for somebody to kill him then. I don't even think he could do it. Yeah. Well. I mean, yeah. I mean, you, you have somebody has to, I mean, 
fuck, man. I don't know. That's that's a rough way. Like I don't know. Like I always talked about that when I saw Christopher Reeve. It's like, you know, I understand you want to live, but I yeah. mean, at a certain point, you know, when you're stressed on everybody around you, do you want to go ahead? Like I mean, you know, what do you do? I I don't know. I I'm a I'm a leave me plugged in guy. I mean, that's bad news for my younger girlfriend because I'm sure she's got big plans past my. Now, uh, do you have that done in a trust or? Well, I will. Trust me, when it starts well, coming around. That's why, actually, because that is such a hard topic for a loved one to do. Yeah. And I don't want to put that on Jen, that I actually right. have that in a trust where I have, uh, if something happens to me, I have it stated already. If I'm not yeah. mentally capable of making a decision, yeah. the decision's made already. It's actually, I've taken it out of my wife's hands. Okay. She can't make that decision. Well, are, uh, are you going or staying? Uh, no, pull the plug. Okay. See, you're, you're, my Jennifer is going to be very jealous of your Jennifer because your Jennifer will be rid of you long yeah. gone, right? And my Jennifer will be like, fuck, there's nothing I can do. I just yeah. got to change the goddamn filter yeah, no, I every do two that. hours because I'm legally <laughs> obligated. Yeah. He won't let us pull the plug. No. Uh, the only way you can keep me plugged in is if I'm in a coma. If yeah. there's brain waves, then you can leave me up. But if my brain goes, because mm -hmm. of obviously my beliefs of how what existence actually is, but if uh, if there's nothing upstairs and I'm just a carcass keeping my uh, organs warm, yeah, pull the plug, get it ready, and harvest me out. You know, maybe I can help somebody else have a, a better life. You know, hmm. yeah. Yeah. But but to, just to play devil's advocate there, my thought is even if you're incapable of speech, having a pulse would still allow us to technically l use your name to market this podcast. So I don't know if I'd uh, be too hasty with that. I might file an injunction. <laughs> Hold uh, it up a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Keep the podcast going. All right. No, that's like that real morbid joke where a guy, <laughs> real quick, the synopsis is, is like, you know, the guy comes out and tells, you know, the doctor comes to talk to me and goes, you know, your wife was the horrific accident you know you're gonna have to change your diaper every day blah 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 like you know names off a, a yeah. litany of just how awful and hard life's gonna be he goes oh he goes now nah, i'm just fucking with you she's dead doesn't that seem better you know? <laughs> <laughs> no she's dead man you, got, you don't have to worry about that yeah all right guys what let me let me ask you in closing here uh just sharing your uh your veteran perspectives you know i was talking about my flawed strategy with the the black celebrities because what ends up happening is after uh, February, once March 1st gets here, I have to have a fire sale. Uh -huh. It looks like I turn suddenly racist because well, I'm you dumping while, you every drop, black person off the roster. You have to wait every 30 days to drop you one, do. right? You do. Have you guys either personally experienced or, or seen a flawed strategy like that? Like, seems like it could make sense, but then when you really look at it, you're like, what the hell was I thinking? That's not a good idea. Yeah, I've seen a bunch of guys, yeah, a bunch of players try to pick up uh, celebrities that are over 100 to try to get solo picks off of oh, them exclusively. Makes... Right. And Knowing that no one wants somebody who's 103, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they, they do the reverse of Kirk Douglas where everyone's dropping him and they'll hold on to him and hope that they get solos out of him or hope they get solos out of him at the draft. And then as six months, eight months of so the year roll on and they've only got eight points, they realize, ah, oh, I kind of fucked up. So yeah. I got to switch up. Yeah. So in, in Damn Yankees, this is the first time I've done the all all of the solo, what, uh, the, all of the bonus point picks, yeah. all musicians. I've, I've never, and so far, I've uh, with zero, I'm uh, tied for fourth place with everybody else. So it's not working <laughs> so far. Although, uh, to, to dovetail onto the musician thing, I saw you guys pose this question on the uh, Celebrity Death Pool uh, Twitter the other day. Should the Leonard Skinner bonus, which is the plane crash, should that be elevated because of the statistical improbability of it happening? And I think that's a great debate because, yeah. I mean, you think about you have a 1 in 365 chance of dying on your birthday. I, I can't right. imagine what it would be in a plane crash. Well, I mean, in the U.S., when's the last time we've even – I think – we have to go back to 9-11. Right? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, certainly for a commercial. I mean, I think, well, in 2000, I mean, and Trump made it to where in 2016, there wasn't a single fatality in, uh, in yeah, the air. Yeah, yeah, he, he didn't. He did, yeah, he just, he just claimed his year. Yeah. And didn't point out Absolutely. that. Yeah, the other years uh, uh, followed a very similar suit. Yeah. What is there? Is there an active debate down there at uh, Bisbee HQ about elevating that bonus category? Uh, well, Mark, uh, you know, one of the code monkeys, uh, and, you know, he posts as well, you know, he came up with that. He's like, well, you know, it's, it is, 
it's slim to none that this is going to happen. Yeah. So maybe we should elevate the points a little bit. I mean, he just threw out a thousand points as a joke, but yeah, you know, yeah, some of these point systems we may need to jack up a little bit more and make it, uh, you know. Now, a little do, bit more of a payoff. Do we always use examples of prior deaths, or do we all think of anything creative? Like I, I think like a you know if we were to do like a big bonus, like a five hundred point bonus, I would want to make a creative one. Like okay, shot by uh, you know the husband of the woman you're sleeping with in the act. Ooh, you know what I mean? right, like, right. The insertion clause. You know what I mean? Like if, if you're oh. still in it when a bullet goes through you. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Yeah, just the real, the real. Uh, Which seems plausible, like it could happen. I just, yeah. I can't think of anybody famous lately that got shot in the act of right. banging someone else's wife. Well, that, back in the back in the day when I started this thing with Stan Hope, and we were just, I was just keeping track on an Excel spreadsheet. One of the original points, uh, bonus points I used was autoerotic asphyxiation oh. because of carotene. Yeah, right, because we have an actual good example one. of it happening. Yeah. yeah. Uh, has, has yeah no that that would be a good one uh, and and there's been a number of other people who've done that I think too or at least now the the problem there though guys is going to be in the verification isn't it because exactly. a lot of times those things are labeled suicide you know Frank has told me that uh, uh, this <laughs> and was I know exactly how you'll handle it yeah yeah th 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 this this is a conversation that came up early in our uh, friendship guys when when we realized that the two of us were in this for the long haul Frank once said to me and I think we're talking about about David Carradine or yeah. something, and Frank said, "Man, if you ever find me like that, he goes, cut me down and pull my pants up before you call an ambulance." And I said, "No." And then Richard answered like a true buddy. Yeah, I said, well, "Let me let me tell you the kind of friend I am. If I find you dead, I'm going to string you up and pull your pants down right. before I call." <laughs> Before I call, and Frank goes, Frank goes, yep. yeah, he goes, I could see my wife now just, just crying over my coffin going, I didn't even know he was into that. And I'd look at her and go, neither did he. Yeah. <laughs> that, I would be in trouble for that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, she'd be like, you get a secret sexually from me? I'm like... <laughs> Yeah. All ah, right. That's beautiful. I love it. Everybody can uh, follow along, play along at Doug Stanhope's Celebrity Death .com. Like I said, if uh, you're just hearing about this and uh, you have a dark sense of humor and you and your buddies want to start a league, you can start your own right there at any point during the year. Uh, and if you're one of our uh, listeners who is playing with us, then uh, hopefully that gave you a little bit of insight into the trade round, which, as I said, basically as we tape, by the time you're hearing this, uh, if you're hearing it within the first 24 hours or so of the uh, episode being released, uh, get to your rosters you're and right. examine your trade round. Yeah. Did Okay. You're playing. Oh, Mikey! Look at Mikey, our yeah. producer over yeah. here, just sitting here quietly, not saying anything. Mikey, do you have your eye on anybody for uh, trade day? Uh, no, not really. I'm I'm happy I got on the board with uh, the pre well, it's the preacher guy, Billy Graham. Yeah. You're yeah. on the board. Yeah, one point. I'm. I was. I was happy to get that. Oh, uh, I didn't realize that. Okay. You don't want to go through a no hitter. Yeah. That was always my fear with this. Yeah. Is that I'd get nobody. It's happened. Yeah. I, I've, I've lived it. I've lived. I think that happened to me one year. Who? Uh, what's your team name, Mikey? Uh, it's probably just my name because I probably couldn't figure out how to get back in if it wasn't just my name. Okay, Mikey Kelch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's That's in our. Uh, yeah. That's why. Like, how do I get in? I'm all sign in. I'm all here we yeah. Go. Sign into Twitter. Here yeah, you go. <laughs> he's in our damn Yankees league. All right, guys. Well, uh, it's always very informative. I'm glad to see that uh, the fun house is down there, uh, all a buzz and open for business. Even with uh, Doug being out of the country, and you guys are still cranking out episodes of the Doug Stanhope podcast, even with Doug being uh, away, right? Yeah, uh, we did one uh, uh, this last weekend. Of course, it's boring as hell because Doug's not there. But uh, we'll see if Shaylee decides to put it out. So okay. we'll see. Okay, very good. Everybody, subscribe to the podcast uh, if you're not already listening. If you enjoy ours, you're certainly gonna enjoy theirs. 100%. And uh, all right, uh, well, good luck in uh, battle to you fellows. Uh, I know we're adversaries in the death pool, but uh, we're we're <laughs> we're friends outside the funeral home. So best of it. luck to you. Thanks for uh, joining us late, and uh, take care of Bisbee down there. And we'll talk to you real soon. Okay, guys. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, guys. Chad Shank and Joby Whitlock of Doug Stanhope Celebrity Death Pool. Adios. 
covered a lot of ground on this yep. episode, Frank. We broke down a lot of uh, MMA fights, both in the UFC and outside the UFC. We talked to an actor of a, a current Academy Award winning film. Uh, and we uh, did the darkest of all segments out of any given month here on Phone Booth Fighting, and that's where we go deep, deep into the X's and O's of Celebrity Death Pool. About the only thing we didn't do is politics. We're going to save it for next time. Yeah, we have some big, I mean, hey, We do. Them. Save it for an next Rex episode. Rex is out. I know. We'll talk about it on our next episode because you're in training, buddy. You got a bedtime. Yeah, I, I heard do. You got, I heard you got given a bedtime. I was. The wife right now, that's why mm-hmm. I, I just gave her the quick text. Five minutes because she, what did she tell me? She's like, I swear to God, you're training for a fight. You need to be in bed. You're going to train three hearts. That's what I used to tell my mom. Come on, five more minutes, mom. Yeah, Come on. I just did the five minutes thing yeah. to the wife. Like, well, okay. Man, I'm All hanging right. out with Richie. Come on, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Frank's uh, Frank's training for, I tell you, I wish I could go to bed at a decent hour. I can't wind down. You know what I'm going to do? When I get home, uh, I will uh, I, I, I will have to sort of like mentally decompress. First, I do a lot of editing and stuff like that, load right. all this into a computer. But um, I will usually have to turn something on television like a documentary or something like that, mm. something that I can kind of drift off to that I don't have to be watching, but the the voice will feel sort of educational. It'll be telling me about something as I drift into sleep. Either political documentaries or music documentaries are usually good for that. That works. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm naturally a night person, but uh, years of having to wake up with uh, babies and children. Well, yeah, that, uh, yeah. Now, because, I mean, that's the pattern. Even my training program is based off a guy that has children. You know, a lot of guys, you know, they train first thing in the morning, which I do after we drop the kids off at school. Yeah. Then I train in the afternoon. But I don't take a lot of break between my afternoon, noon, you know, session and, and then my evening striking session. Uh, my, I only get about an hour and a half, two hours break. I eat, you know, get my post meal recovery stuff and then get right back to it because I don't, I, I can't train at seven or eight o'clock at night mm-hmm. th- th- consistently this far out because, you know, I, it takes too much away from me spending time with the kids and dude, you only live one time and my children are very important to me. So I, I, my training schedule, you still get it in. And then I don't really convert that over until I'm about two weeks left. So three weeks out from the fight, two weeks of training camp, because you don't train the last week, really. You're, yeah. you're off uh, wherever you're going to be fighting at. That's when I switch off the heavy training to be late at night. Otherwise, you know, I just can't. So because I do that, I'm always waking up early. Even this morning, you know, 6.15 in the morning, I'm sitting there, boom, my eyes open up. But I've had a good night's sleep. I go to bed typically at 9 o'clock. I shut everything down, and about a half hour into it, I'm out. Oh, I'm envious. I uh, wish I could do that. But, I mean, the old me, you know, before I had kids, yeah. Yeah. You know, or until they got to the point where, you know, you couldn't just give them a bottle and snuggle with them. Yeah. You know, oh, they're up, but, you know, the, you know I've babysitted that way. You know, yeah. kind of half asleep, but I just trap off an area on the floor so I know yeah. they're safe. There's nothing they can choke on. Turn the TV on and just pass out again. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. they're safe. Here's the bottle, you know. Yeah. I became a king of sleeping and feeding at the same time. Trapping it in your neck, you know? <laughs> yeah. You ever seen guys do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I got yeah. really good at the ch- keeping my chin down by holding a bottle, you know, yeah. and then you make a nice little cradle with your arms so they're protected from everything. And and there's also this that makes you less susceptible to your kid's KO punch. Yeah. Tuck the chin like that. That's smart. Yeah. Man, actually, talk about that. Ronan last night kicked the shit out of me. Oh, yeah? Yeah, you know, he doesn't like the cover, so sometimes he kicks it off. Yeah. And uh, he, of course, he sleeps sideways on the bed. Anybody who sleeps with their children, you know, in, in bed probably can relate to me that they could be chaotic little, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what he was dreaming about. We were sitting there, and he stomped hard. I mean, all heel in the face, woke me up, and I'm oh. like. And you were on your back. That's illegal. Uh, I mean, that he, right he there should have been down a point. Opponent. Yeah, that should have yes, been a point. Yes, he did. But, you know, yeah. hey, he's my kid. I love him. So yeah. uh, when he gets older and we're sparring, I owe him a kick to the head. <laughs> Just a quick little right. That was when you were That's eight. That's right. I'll remind you. All right, I'm closing the laptop, which means this uh, episode is about to conclude. But before it does, Frank, tell everybody uh, why they need to click through that Amazon banner yep. on the front of PhoneBoothFighting.com. Well, if you know, go PhoneBoothFighting.com, our website, and there'll be an Amazon banner there. Click on there before you do any of your shopping on Amazon. And by doing so, uh, at no extra cost to you when you 
purchasing your wants, your needs, doing things for the wife, doing things for around the house, a small percentage goes back to us. And you know, and we can use that to here to help our show. Uh, actually, give Mikey a salary instead That's of right. you know, just, he's not digging the signed autographs anymore. I think mm-hmm. that I, the fifteenth autograph on my, th- you mm-hmm. know, he's got, and he's going to explain to the police officer why he has fifteen pictures of me, yeah. not wearing a shirt in his car. He already looks like a creepy stalker. Yeah, yeah, yeah it doesn't help. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that uh, that helps us. You can support the show through our Amazon banner at phoneboothfighting.com. You can also support the show by buying official Phone Booth Fighting merchandise that is available in the online store section uh, with multiple designs and colors and styles and sizes of uh, T-shirts that we have. And uh, also, uh, really the most important thing uh, you can do for us is to tell a friend about this podcast. Spread the word, Spread man. the word. That's how we grow it, one listener at a time or organically if you look us up phone booth fighting on itunes click on those five stars we are getting very close to our 300 five star review which uh, we very much appreciate sponsors look at that stuff by the way and uh, that that helps us bring sponsors to the show and bring supporters and stay up high in the rankings on uh, itunes so click on those five stars Uh, if you want to take an extra moment write a favorable line or two we like to read those on the air and we'll be doing that here uh, in uh, short order probably on the next couple episodes all right uh for Mikey, doing an awesome job as always producing. And uh, for Frank Mir over there, I am Richard Hunter, and we'll see you right back here next time on Phone Booth Fighting.